chapter 4. We're going to be uh, getting to that passage again tonight. We started it last night looking at the temptations of Jesus while he's in the wilderness. Um, obviously, that's within a, a whole series of lessons that we've been going over, as, as already has been indicated. Um, just looking at the, the, the notion of, of being able to overcome sin and temptation and how we can resist it. God has made clear that we absolutely can resist it. There's, there's really no doubt about that. And actually, as, as we conclude the week, one of the things that I uh, one of the things that I mentioned is just that again, because <laughs> I want to repeat that notion over and over. The fact that God actually does say uh, to man, to his creation, you can resist this. Uh, that's so I think that's just such a key. Uh, that's such a critical point to to hammer in, because I think sometimes whether it be because of the, the religious world around us or whatever the case may be, it may be easy to forget that. Can't forget that if we are if we are uh, trying to fight on God's side in this battle in this spiritual warfare, and so God says that we can resist it, but what it's going to take is is very serious uh, and, and a very serious willfulness to get over these things that corrupts us, that makes it harder to serve God. But but I will just say. The more that that becomes a habit, the more that this becomes a part of the routine, the more we practice righteousness, I, 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 do, I do think that, at least if I'm not mistaken, it does get easier to, to let go of the, of the previous practices of sin. And hopefully what we'll see as we go throughout the week is just how, how that actually uh, it is, it actually that comes about frequently, uh, or how it can come about frequently, specifically to those who are willing to do what God says. So last night uh, we, we began looking at the, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, the par parallels between the wandering in the wilderness of Israel and Jesus and then ultimately even of us today. I think that there are many connections that we can make about people. We are people who are uh, wandering in the wilderness to a degree because we are those who are of a uh, set apart people. We are waiting to, uh, we are citizens of, that are waiting that home. And so um, as we are strangers to a degree, we understand that we are in hostile territory, um, specifically with, with uh, the enemy just really trying to aim for our destruction and our demise. And so we continue tonight by looking at how Jesus remained uh, firm and steadfast during the most, I would say, strenuous moments of just physical and mental fatigue. Uh, and maybe even emotional fatigue as, as he's fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights, you would be very hungry. And we already looked at how, though, uh, with that being the case, he still got past the, the lust of the flesh um, th that he was tempted with to when, when Satan tried to get him to turn the stones into bread. Jesus had the capability. He absolutely could have done it. The problem was that he was trying to get Jesus to act outside of God's will. That is, That was the main point. And I would say that's what he keeps trying to do with each of these temptations, with what we're going to see tonight and what we're going to see tomorrow night in the last temptation. But but while, there, while there's that commonality, I do believe as we looked at 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 through 16, those three elements uh, really that encompass all temptation. I think, he, I think each of these... Uh, are, are actually depicted within these three temptations that Jesus suffers through, that he endures so so perfectly. And so we want to look at his example, just like always, to figure out how is it that we get over temptation. Well, I think tonight, as you look at those three uh, different kinds of temptations in 1 John chapter 2, I think what you find tonight is not the lust of the flesh, but the lust of the eyes. And so we'll pick up in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Just picking up in that second temptation, after Satan fails, it says in verse 5, The devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And, and it just in those couple of verses, you have uh, Jesus so quickly just shut the devil down, just shut uh, the adversary down um, just immediately. And 
I just think, I do think it's somewhat humorous that here Satan has struck at an opportune time as we talked about last night. And even though it is absolutely an opportune, opportune moment, it doesn't really seem to be much of an advantage, to, to serve, at least when you're talking about Jesus, someone who truly, sincerely does care about doing the will of his Father. And it's something that never leaves his mind, something that never leaves, uh, never uh, shakes his resolve. And so, again, we'll just be focusing on these couple of verses tonight. And what I want to start with is just looking at the tactic of Satan, first of all. This is what I want to do with each temptation. But he says, um, just, just remember that he repeats himself as he said at the beginning of the first temptation. He says, hey, if you are the son of God, and I think maybe trying to appeal to some kind of pride maybe. But he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. And he quotes scripture. Uh, and so this is one tactic that I think um, Satan uses frequently and even incidentally today. He uses scripture and he says it, he says it verbatim. He doesn't mess up here. He exactly quotes the passage in Psalm 91, which we'll turn there in just a moment. But just from the outset, understand that he, he quotes it verbatim. And it's not like he leaves a word out. He, he says he knows the law. Certainly. The, the, as we have already seen in Genesis chapter 3, he has always known the law. Going back to Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we didn't read uh, at the very beginning here. But in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? When the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, or you touch it, or you will die. And now I would just mention before we move on that Eve, even though it doesn't seem like she was there when God actually said that to Adam, it seems to be uh, just communicated by Adam to Eve. Even though it was related that way, she understood it perfectly. And so it doesn't sound like anything was lost in translation. But you get to verse 5. Or in, in verse 4, rather. And it says, The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so, uh, <laughs> even from the beginning, God, uh, the serpent, Satan, the adversary, the devil, he knows the scriptures. He knows the words of God. In fact, even from the beginning, he's tried to use them to deceive. He's tried to use them to get people to sin against God. He, uses, he tries to use his very words against him. Now, ultimately, uh, no matter what happens, we still find God wins. And that should be a reassuring thing. And that's one of the main encouragements when it comes to resisting temptation, incidentally. But I, I think this is still something that people struggle with today. I mean, clearly, we could look at many examples. I just want to look at one. But this is one that you probably see in bumper stickers all the time or, or just people quote uh, in passing. We'll start with just the verse that people uh, usually quote, and then we'll look at the context. But just looking in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And people will, I mean, they'll tattoo that on themselves, to just have it on them for all their life. And, and because it sounds really nice, and honestly, it is a beautiful promise that God gives to his people. But people generally don't know the context of what Jeremiah, or what God is saying through the prophet Jeremiah. Do you, do you recall where Jeremiah falls in the history of Israel? Pretty much right before Babylon comes in and takes all of Judah, rather, the, the southern kingdom. And so his language is very, is, is very sorrowful. I mean, he, one of the, the, the other book that we have by Jeremiah is literally Lamentations, the Lamentations of Jeremiah. And all of that because they have gone so far away that they don't even look like God's special people. They, they certainly don't look like a holy nation, the, what they are supposed to look like, a nation that is, is holy and, and so focused on mimicking on imitating that righteousness of God, that God could dwell in their midst. They don't look like that at all. In fact, they look like all the other nations. And in some instances, they almost look worse. And so here Jeremiah is, it, within Jeremiah, all throughout, there's just that, that really dark kind of language. But so here's a beautiful moment. 
within that book, but you, you don't forget all the other language. In fact, you look at the context. In verse 10, it says, For thus says the Lord, When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Generally, when people tattoo this verse on themselves, they have no idea that this is right after God says, Guess what? You're still going to Babylon. You're still going to get the judgment. But, but, when you go through, the, when, when you're there for seven years, after the seven years have been completed, after the judgment has been completed, I will bring you back. I will remember my word. Though you have been faithless, I will remain faithful. And it's, it, yes, it's absolutely beautiful, but people have no idea why it is. You go on past that in verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me. You will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Now, first of all, it starts with the context of you haven't, you haven't gotten to this point yet. You're going to Babylon. But then after the fact, he then starts talking about obedience. Oh, goodness. People certainly do not want to bring that context into, you know, that verse being tattooed on themselves or on their bumper sticker. They really like that as a platitude, as really an empty platitude with no meaning. But they forget everything, all of God's condition, conditions that are supposed to go along with that. Obedience and seeking after it. Well, people don't really want to seek after it. So even today, you still, and I know there's several other examples, but here's one that just... <laughs> It ticks me off the most because there's, there's just so much that's being said that people just straight up ignore. Uh, and, and a lot of times willfully. But sometimes they just they don't even – they just pick something out without even understanding where they're getting it from. And so this still is a, a tactic that Satan uses today. He says, hey, it's written. All of these good things are going to happen. How many televangelists do you, do you still hear? I don't even know how they still have jobs. I don't know how they've gone this long and been this successful. But they are. And all because they use the same tactic that the devil has always used, using God's word and trying to and warping it into meaning something that it isn't supposed to mean. And incidentally, that's the next point. It is, it is not misquoted, as we already said, but it is absolutely misinterpreted. Uh, over in Psalm 91, <coughs> Psalm 91 in verse 11, it says, For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Again, it is verbatim, the quote. He doesn't, he doesn't mess it up at all, and he doesn't leave any words out. Well, he does, but out of those two verses, it, it, it's exactly quoted correctly. And then in verse 14, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on mine because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Now, I will just say, Brother Marshall McDaniel, he has preached a lesson on this idea of calling upon the name of the Lord. And, and he goes on, a history, really, he gives a history lesson of what that looks like. It's something that started all the way back in Genesis uh, with Seth, one of the son, sons of um, Adam and Eve after Cain and Abel. And, and, and it's these sons, it is these descendants that start calling upon the name of the Lord. And what he really, one of the things he emphasizes going through that history of what that looks like is this means people are, are ready to obey. Kind of like what we were already talking about, that notion of obedience. These are people who are not just, are not, as people do today, just giving a mere physical or, or rather verbal incantation to a degree. No, it's much more than that. That if you call upon the Lord, that means that you are, are pledging yourself to him, that you are truly making a vow to him. You're not just saying random words and then all of a sudden everything goes. No, you're actually trying to seek after God like we just read in Jeremiah chapter 29. But also look at verse 14. All of this, he says, all these beautiful things he says, because he has loved me. That's a part of that seeking after God. Um, and, and, and so, you know, again. It is interesting how people, even still to this day, you know, they, they will pull scripture out from its context. And, and, you, and you know how this goes. You, you've heard many conversations like this. Someone brings a passage up and, you, and, and they have a clear implication there. They're like, well, hey, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just quoting scripture. It's like, you're, no, you're doing a lot more than that. You have chosen a very specific um, situation to put this very specific passage into 
And whether it be arbitrarily or not, people do that all the time. I remember uh, one time, it, it was when COVID was still new, it was when COVID was very fresh and really no one had any idea. No one. Everyone said that, you know, we should do it every which way. No one knew the right thing to do. It was, it was a difficult time. That, that should not have been a time where brethren were speaking harshly about each other. I, there was actually one message that a, a, a group chat that I was in, and I, and I was just kind of bothered by some of the things that were said. And I said, listen, this is a rough time. I understand it's rough, and we need to do everything we can to help one another. But remember that God says, remember that the Bible says, we can't live in anxiety. We can't live in fear. We have to, we have to be completely satisfied with whatever God decides for our lives. And, and I don't know if it was that eloquent when I typed it out, but um, I don't even know if it's that eloquent now. But, you know, I, 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 I texted them that, and one person in particular, I think most everyone understood what I was trying to say, that at least the sentiment of it. I was being genuine. But one person did not want to take it that way, and they said, well, you know what the Bible also says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse uh, uh, 13? It also says, do not murder. And I was like, wow. So... If I somehow get COVID and I have no idea and I accidentally give it to somebody and they die, that makes me a murderer. You understand what you just implied? And, the, and one of the problems was I think a lot of people did understand what they were implying. They, she chose that verse very specifically. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you just be reckless. If, if you know that you're sick and you just, you just try to sneeze on everybody, I'm not saying that. But at the same time, how are you going to look at a brother or a sister in Christ? I'm not talking about someone of the world who doesn't know any better. But a brother and sister in Christ and make these kinds of accusations. What a terrible thing to say. And I, I will just say, generally, I, you know, sticks and stones, you know, break my bones, but words don't. Those words did hurt. And it's because they made a very strong point. Now, ultimately, they used it completely out of context. And they completely uh, abused the passage. But, you know, they got their point across. And that's really all that matters uh, in the end, isn't it? And I think that is the tactic of Satan. And it always has been one of the tactics of Satan since the very beginning. Uh, but you could also use, just for an example, those who, you know, just, just anything today, especially when it comes to anything that is even remotely regarded as political. You think about the transgender movement or ideology. You speak out against that, and oh, somehow, I mean, they will say you're a murderer <laughs> because you, you know, because somehow you judged. Well, listen, this is something that God Himself has already judged. He has made male and female. That's it. But you say that, and they say that's hate speech, and then they say, well, that accounts for murder. What a, what a gigantic leap. And, and Christians are not supposed to talk like that. And Christians, well, if, if, I will just say, if we are trying to use certain passages or we're saying certain things just to be, you know, uh, just to be aggressive and just to be mean to people, well, there's something to be said there. But this is, the, this is one of the tactics that Satan has always used. And so... He takes God's word too far frequently. Ultimately, he tries to take God's word so far that he, that he is challenging God himself. He's trying to use the perfect revelation of God against God. Now, what we find is that just isn't going to work. Ultimately, that doesn't work. But he's done, he does that frequently. And so just understanding that I think is helpful when it comes to trying to resist like Jesus when we look at his example, specifically Matthew chapter 4. Well, Coming back to Matthew chapter 4, after he has you know, said you know, it is written and he quotes Psalm 91, how does Jesus respond? The first thing that comes out of his mouth is, on the other hand, it is also written. This idea, of, of this really struck me as I was studying this and I saw Jesus say, on the other hand, because what it shows is a much needed balance. Really what I think it comes to all communication. But especially when you're coming to the Bible and you are trying to see what God wants you to interpret. Not what I want to interpret, not what Luke wants to interpret, not what anyone wants to interpret. What does God want me to interpret from this? And so we need to have a balance as we approach Scripture, as we approach God's revealed Word. Jesus, um, a a a after he says this, on the other hand, it is written, he quotes a passage, I think, with a very specific, with, with a very particular context. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
in verse um, 16. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. It says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. You should diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore to give your fathers by driving out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has spoken. Now, again, it, it, he doesn't he doesn't say that, you know the word massa as he's quoting it, but it still ha it brings that context with it, and I think that he does this for a purpose. Now, remember, every time he responds, I think he's using wilderness language, as I, as I put it yesterday. Uh, it, he is. Suffering in the wilderness, just like the children of Israel wandered and suffered many temptations in the wilderness. Um, and so he uses the very words that Moses uses as he's trying to remind the people of how they, what they should have acted like and, and what they need to remember from now on so that they can overcome when they didn't in the past. And so uh, he quotes that from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16, really hearkening back to the story of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17. What happens in Exodus chapter 17? Well, you have the people. They have been wandering for a while. This is really just very uh, uh, close to the moment that they had been delivered from Egypt. And so even with that, just the, the pressure on their minds, they start grumbling and they start complaining because I'm, I'm thirsty. I want water. And, and so God... He provides for them. He, he provides for them uh, the, the water. Uh, he, he always provides for them, as you see constantly, not just in Exodus chapter 17, but you also find that in Numbers chapter 20. At the beginning of both those stories, what you find is they do the exact same thing. They grumble and they complain. It's not, it's certainly not a temperament or uh, uh, it's not an attitude that we want to emulate, at least not from the people of Israel. Rather, it should have been that they waited patiently. They should have been more like Jesus, who, listen, I am thirsty. And I'm thirsty almost to death. And I'm hungry almost to death. But just like Jesus, I'm willing to starve for the glory of my Father. I, he's already taken care of us. I know he'll take care of us further. They should have acted like Jesus, but they didn't. Now, even though God provided for Israel, though they were rebellious, and though they were obstinate consistently, I just want to ask a couple of questions. One. Since God did provide for them, even though that was the case, does that mean that we're to learn from this that God was pleased with Israel? I don't think anybody would be brave enough to say, oh yeah, it sure does look like in Exodus chapter 17 that he was pleased with his, with his people complaining and grumbling. No, you don't see that in Exodus chapter 17. Well, does this mean then that, that they were right in how they attained the water and how they attained that provision from God? No. You see, here is a lesson of God's mercy. Here is a lesson of God's grace. He has given them what they did not deserve in a, in a time where they absolutely deserved more in, on the punishment side. But even though that was the case, he gave them, he gave them water. He provided for them like the father that he is, like the caring, uh, providing father that he is. And so here is a lesson of God's mercy. It is not a lesson where we find that the people of Israel, this is an attitude we want to emulate, that we want to look, that we want to sound just like them. Rather, this is a lesson of don't sound like them. Don't put the Lord your God to the test like you did at Massa. That's the point. And so, again, I, I think he uses this uh this this passage uh, to kind of bring in that context just to, I think to make some of these points that just because he is a gracious God that doesn't even get to just put the grace of God to the test as we find constantly throughout the book of Romans well going beyond that you want to turn to Judges chapter 6 Judges chapter 6 this is after of course they've um, after they've invaded and conquered the land uh, the promised land and they are able to enjoy this beautiful blessing and provision that God has given them, that God has absolutely given them. Uh, as we've already made the case, they did not get it by their own right. They didn't get it by their own power. It was God that led them and guided them the whole way. Well, here in Judges chapter 6, all throughout Judges, I think what you find is just constantly stories over and over again that really... They should look a lot different than most of them seem to. You know, you look at a story, you look at a character like Samson. 
Samson, we do find that there are faithful moments in his life. And even the Hebrew writer talks about Samson. But when you read throughout his life, his whole life is not very, uh, it, it, it is not something that you want to teach your kids <laughs> to act like. This is a child. This is the exact way that I want you to treat me as a parent. No, that, that's clearly not what we want to get from Samson. He, he, he was a petty child. When, especially when it came to the counsel of his parents disregarding it completely, when it came to uh, how he should react in certain situations, he was very impatient. He was very, he was very absurd at times. And certainly, you're not going to look at this the, the foolish moment where, after all of these betrayals by his wife, he just go he went ahead and just gave her the answer anyway. You know, you're not going to teach your child all of those things, but you are going to teach the moments that what, that the Hebrew writer talks about, that where he was faithful. Now, with Samson, I think it's a lot harder to find those moments, but we know they're there. Now, I think Gideon is is I, not as he's not as hard of a character to, to find those faithful moments, but especially at the beginning in Judges chapter six, I don't think you find a very good story of, of Gideon who is trying to who is just incredibly faithful. Rather, I think what you find is instead of that, what faithfulness does not look like. Because at the beginning, he starts so he starts so with so much doubt and almost cowardly. He makes God prove himself over and over again. And let me just say, we are not in a position to make God prove himself. Who is the one who tests? It is God. We made that case yesterday. I am in no position. It is not my role. And honestly, I don't even have the faculty. I don't even have close to the faculty to, to try and put God to the test. It is he that puts us to the test. And, but, but here you find yet again God being gracious, I think. And so in Judges chapter 6 and verse 36, beginning, it says, Then Gideon said to God, If you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, if you really mean that, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me, as you have spoken. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed out the uh, or squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Now I absolutely know, and I'm going to do everything you say. No. Instead, in verse 39, do not let your anger burn against me that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew on all the ground. God did so that night, for it was dry on the fleece, and dew was on all the ground. Now, you go throughout that story of Gideon, and you find already it doesn't, it doesn't look as, I would say, ready as, as uh, Samuel when he is called to be one of God's judges and prophets. And it doesn't look as ready as Isaiah, maybe. I, Jeremiah, send me. It doesn't look like that. Already you see much doubt within Gideon's life. But then you go on, and even after the, the, uh, the men are chosen, you, you see once more in Gideon's life, he needs a little bit more encouragement from God. Now, this isn't to say that every that, that you cannot have any doubt, and if you have any doubt, that you're just a faithless individual. I'm not saying that at all. But here is a case where I, I think that there should have been much more confidence. Because who who is this but the Lord, Yahweh, the I Am, who led all of Israel out of Egypt, and here you are putting it to the test with these silly little signs. Instead of just saying, yes, sir, here am I, send me, I want to do everything you say. And, I, and here's a moment where he could have thought, oh, God is, God is using me to be, be a leader like Moses. Instead of thinking that, he immediately goes to the doubt. And so I, I'm not saying there's nothing to take from Gideon. Please don't misunderstand me. But what I am saying, I don't think it's ever a good idea to say that one of the most faithful moments in Gideon's life was putting God to the test. I don't think that's the case at all. So the story doesn't teach us that faithfulness is making God prove himself first before we do anything. No, no, that's not how this works. We are, we don't have that right. It is God who has that right to put us to the test. But how easy is it to test God with certain convictions or doubts or worries that we have frequently? You know, just a couple of examples, but you know, in questions that, you know, people ask, whether it be in a, in a you know, children's class, you know, high school class or whatever, or, or, or beyond that. You talk about modesty, modesty especially. What is the question that people, 
and generally it's younger people. But it doesn't matter the age, it actually happens all throughout. No matter who you are, you get that question of, well, how, how high is too high? Ultimately, how close can I get to the line? I would just say that if you look back at Exodus chapters 19 and 20, the people, when God put boundaries around the Mount, Mount, Mount Sinai, and, and they saw the thick darkness and the clouds, and they heard the trumpet, and they heard that like thunder, and they heard the voice of God from the clouds, they didn't want to get close to the boundaries. God says you must set boundaries, and, and when they heard the voice of God, oh, they backed off. They even, they even said to Moses, can, can you just... Can you just go and talk to God yourself and then bring us back the words? Because, frankly, we are pretty sure we're going to die if we hear it anymore. And I want to say, I don't think that that's, that's necessarily a bad response, even in Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 4, maybe it's chapter 5, where, where uh, Moses says that, that was good. That fear, that reverence, that was what, that's where you need to start. And it needs to grow in harmony with love, and that's where I think Israel ultimately fails. But I just all say all that to say, when they heard God's voice and they saw just a fraction of his glory, they weren't saying, how close can we get to the line? Oh, no. They were like, <laughs> how far can I get away? And I think that's the point with, with temptation. It is not, let's see how close we can get to the line that God makes. It is. When God makes a line, guess what? That line means death and that means danger. Not because God is just, is, is just trying to, to keep us from having fun. No, but he's trying to keep us from that death and destruction. And so what am I going to do? I'm just going to frivolously walk on by. No, I'm going to respect that line that God has given. It's not just with modesty, but you think about just when it comes to sexual temptation or with dating. Young people ask, well, how far can I go without it being sin? Well, that's a stupid question. How, how, how far? What are you talking about? Not how far, not how close can I get, not how close can I get to God's judgment, not how close can I get to God's penalty, his punishment for sin, but rather, where's that line that he says, that is what will destroy you, how far away can I get? That is, that is the question we need to ask. How far away can I run from all these things that God says are not for me? Well, just a few things of application as we think about this exchange between Satan and Jesus. First of all, as we already kind of indicated, God's word is perfectly balanced. And you see this especially with Jesus' initial answer in Matthew chapter 4, as it was the, just the, the title of the last point. On the other hand, there is a deep need for all Christians, all of those who have become servants of God, all of those who are part of his kingdom, to be able to, to, to utilize the whole counsel of God. We need to be able to hear someone use a passage and know when they're trying to take it too far. We need to be able to know the context of the passage that someone is using. So that we can say, I, I, don't think you, I don't think you all the way understand what that means. Kind of like Jeremiah chapter 29. I, I, I you know, maybe we're not going to come, again, aggressively. We're not just going to try to put them down. You know, you can still come to them softly and tenderly, gently, and say, listen, I, 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 that is a beautiful verse. But let me try and show you what fully God is saying here. Because certainly many people just don't understand that. We need to be people who are not caught off guard like Jesus who was never caught off guard. And why is that? Because he knew it. And he knew the context. And he knew all those things. And, and so, but be, to do this, this requires honest discernment and it requires a fair treatment of the scriptures. It requires common sense. There was, I was listening to a, a lesson, um, and it wasn't necessarily on, on temptation and sin, but... It was just, uh, it was the idea that we need, we need to be able to balance the scriptures. We need to have uh, a good understanding of how to interpret scripture. That's important because when you look at, you know, you can just open the Bible to anything. A lot of people do this. They just open up the Bible and they say, okay, well, that's, that's obviously where I need to be because it just happened to land here. Well, you know, take that to its, take that to its most you know, base conclusion. You have somebody, okay, turn to Matthew it just opens, Matthew 27, verse 5. Judas hung himself. Luke chapter 10, verse 37. Go and do likewise. Huh. Is that, is, is that, is that how we interpret? No. That's so silly. It's absurd. It, it, no one, and, and, and hopefully, 
uh, well, I know no one in this room, but I, hopefully not many people take that kind of approach to Scripture. You have to have some common sense here. You have to, uh, you have to bring the, the logic that we use when we just communicate with everyone else when you come to Scriptures. Because guess what? God communicates in the same ways. He communicates to us by telling us and showing us and implying things to us. And if we're going to come stubborn and acting like, well, how can we know? We can know. Come on. That's someone who's not sincere. That's someone who's not genuine. There was, um, you all know, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, what it says there, what Paul says there. It's a beautiful passage, and I don't want to take away from the beauty of it as, as many of, of, of the religious, as much of the religious world does. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, incidentally, there's an example that, that um, I heard. Unfortunately, there was a brother that just read verse 8. Uh, and, and really, this is, this is ultimately what he said about this. His attitude as he read that, he said, brothers, I want to preach this passage. I want to preach it without reservation. I want to preach it without caveat. I want to be able to proclaim it loudly from the rooftops without anybody telling me, hey, wait a minute, don't take that passage too far. The reality is we cannot take the teaching of this passage too far. We cannot take the teaching of God's saving grace too far. I want to teach this passage loudly and boldly without anyone telling me that I need to rein that in or balance it out with some other teaching from the scripture. Let me tell you, that sounds just like what, certain, what, 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 was, what Satan was doing. Did, did he really? Did you just indicate that you want to, as we were just reading a moment, about a moment ago, that you want to take one portion of Scripture, read that, and, re and just completely ignore all the rest of it? All of the rest of the revelation that God has given us. What a, what a terrible, shameful, dangerous thing to say. Now, that doesn't mean that this passage is not beautiful. But guess what? You're taking the beauty away, the intended beauty away, the full power of the beauty of God's revealed will away when you alter it and change it. And, and people always like to leave out that verse 10 whenever they read through this, that we are his workmanship creating Christ Jesus for good works. And so all of God's word is beautiful, but it is not beautiful when man decides to put their own meaning to it. Just understand you're doing something that is dangerous. You're doing something that is going to affect people in, in, in their relationships with God, ultimately affecting their salvation and really affecting yours. It is not your position to put God to the test. It is not my position to put God to the test. We need to just do as God says, obey him, and just take what he says uh, when, when he gives it to us. Now, as we've indicated this whole time, what this takes, it, it, what it takes to do this is to know God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, very quickly. This is the last passage we'll look at. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 15, another familiar passage when he says, uh, well, beginning of verse 14, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. But be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. How do we accurately handle the word of truth? you got to know it first. And so do we know it? That is the question. Do we feel as Jesus feels who says, truly, I live by the, by the word of God? Is it really our sustenance as he, as he talks about in John chapter 4 and verse 34 that my food is to do the will of him who sent me? Can we honestly say that? Are you willing to follow the example of Jesus and just frankly do whatever the Father says for you to do. Someone says, well, all you need is confession. Well, on the other hand, Jesus says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who disbelieves will be condemned. And so when I, when I quote a passage like that in response, does, does that mean that, that, that we're talking about baptism without confession or baptism without repentance? No, what we're saying is, all of that is important, and we're not going to leave any portion of Scripture aside. What it means is we must do all that God has required of us. So have you done all that God has required of you? Have you started that journey of look, trying to look as much like Jesus as possible, imitating him in, in, in 
understanding that it is truly by the word of God that we, that we get life. If you have not become a Christian, I would, I would just say you have no security there. You have no capability. You have no confidence to overcome your sin because you are not going to the only person who can break those bonds. And so if you are, are someone who has not given yourself in that way, given yourself to Christ, been baptized for, for, uh, for, to be put to death, let, put the old man to death, to rise in newness of life, pledging yourself to him, repenting of all of the past sins, all of the things that he says can't be a part of your life anymore. Maybe you are a Christian and you feel like you've brought some of those things back in. And that clearly has overcome you. You don't have to keep living that way. It's, you're not trapped. The, one of the main points I want to get across throughout this entire series is that you are not trapped. You are only trapped when you decide, I don't want to do it anymore. You are only trapped when you say, when you just repeat what the devil says, you can't overcome. Jesus says you can, but you got to go through me. You have to take on everything that I say. Are you willing to do that this very evening? If you are, if you're subject to the invitation to Christ by any means, please let your need be made known as we stand and as we sing.